Hello and welcome to episode 85 of the Roadie Rumble podcast. Today I'm joined by former URI men's basketball player, former A-10 six man of the year, currently ranking among the top players in some of the program's historical records. Delroy James, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. How are you today? I'm all right, man. Thanks for having me. Love what you're doing with this. Hope it gets to wherever you're trying to get it. I appreciate that. Um, first question I have for you is a question I, I love to ask all the, the guests I have on this show, um, which is what is your why or, you know, what motivates you? Um, I love the game of basketball, man. Um, the purity of it, just hooping, the comp- um, competitiveness of it, the back and forth, the the work you put in, seeing it, how it comes out on the court, just everything about the the game of basketball has always been the reason for my why and my love. It began with my love and it will always just end with my love. For sure. And for basketball, you know, you've been able to take that with you, you know, throughout life, obviously growing up, playing the sport, playing obviously at the collegiate level for URI and now playing professionally overseas. But something I do want to ask about is uh, the TBT uh, tournament, which you've been able to kind of take something personal to your life um, and also apply to the game of basketball. Um, and just speaking of your family, you know, you have a son who currently lives with autism. Uh, I know you're a big advocate for autism and you've been mm-hmm. uh, involved in raising awareness and money for such a great cause. Uh, you played for the TBT tournament. You're a member of the Autism Army for the last few years now. Can you just share what it's like to, again, combine that love of basketball um, and at the same time support such great charities and something that you emotionally connect with? Um, it's just, It's like a... I guess it's, I say the ins and the outs of just basically asking the question of like your why's, right? So mm-hmm. with my son being on the spectrum and the, the great tournament that is TBT, creating such a cause, creating such a pathway for where you could just cause awareness for anything that you your home sees desires and you do it through basketball, do it through sports because it's the, the competitiveness, the it's like the that brings just so much joy in people watching something. So just when I wear that jersey and I know I'm playing for the cause of my son while also doing what I love the best is just is is near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I think that's so special, especially to play for people that you care so much about. And I think it, it definitely motivates you um not only to compete, you know, on the court, but off the court and to try and, you know, continue to fight towards something. Um and this is such a great cause. I think the tournament um, it's just so special. You know, I've been watching it for a few years this past couple of years. Um, I think it's it's great to see, you know, college alumni get together. I know Rhode Island is currently working on eventually in the future putting together a TBD team, but also um on the fundraising side for such a great organization. Uh it's pretty cool to see that. I'm a type one diabetic myself, so I'm not sure if there there is a team or anything. It like was, that. it was. I don't know if they still do it, but they for sure have. Yeah, that dope. would definitely that would definitely be cool to see. Um, sticking with TBT, and then we'll shift gears a little bit. But um, pretty cool to see the team success. You know, as of lately for the Autism Army, you guys actually finished as a runner up in the tournament just a year ago. What was that run like for you? Can you talk a little bit about that? Man, is the gift and the curse, man. Going so far and then losing, but also the winning of going so far and the awareness and all the eyes on you and all the eyes on the game. It was just a the feeling was amazing, man. The run was very, very special. Hopefully, we could have came up with the win, make it a little bit more special, but it was very, very fun. Yeah, I can imagine. That's definitely something that uh, you work so hard towards. But in the end, I mean, it's definitely rewarding, again, to do it for such a great charity and, and a great cause. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit here, learn a little bit more about your background. Um, Obviously, you know, your decision to come to URI and then get into, you know, some of your playing uh, years there. But can you just talk a little bit about your recruitment process out of high school and then ultimately what led you to the University of Rhode Island? Uh, well, my recruitment process was a, was a tricky one. So it's like I burst onto the scene out of nowhere, uh, playing in tournaments, going to camps that's probably not even existing today, such as the five-star basketball camp, rest in peace, hard golf, pool, golf and cool, Eastern Invitational, just going back and forth to, to camps and then being seen and then I was seen by a coach that became very close to me, whose son also is on the spectrum. Coach, he's the head coach of Towson basketball now, Patrick Scary. And honestly, he just recruited me when, when we first spoke and just what he's saying about how he's calling me. I'm like, 
nah, he really wants me to go there. So then talking to Scary and then also having a conversation with Coach Barron, I knew, like I knew what and where I wanted to go. And I just felt so comfortable from the door committing, committing to University of Rhode Island and then showing up there. Yeah. I'm curious just to, to stay on Coach Barron for a second. How instrumental was he in that process? And, you know, how much was he really a force in calling you up? Or was he on the phone talking to you and calling you to come down and take a visit? I've I, I've spoke to Coach Barron, honestly, I'm going to be true, probably twice only. Okay. But it was scary that got me there, that got me to commit 100%. But my love for Coach Barron became so much more after I first met him and while I'm on the campus, while he's coaching me, while we're having conversations, while while he just like his trust, the trust he put in me, what he's seen in me. Before I honestly, before I fully seen it myself, my first year at Rhode Island was very, very tough. Uh I, I got I didn't get clear, so I had to become a prop 48. And then the second year, um, due to a school code, school violation, I got I got suspended for a half a semester, wasn't on campus. So I only played three and a half years at, at the University of Rhode Island. So that year when I got suspended, I, I I I luckily was there for the summertime where I took up a lot of credits and made my credits. I could have came back and still be able to play in December, but that whole first semester, I was not on campus. Like I wasn't on campus. That's when coach Brown would call me. I would talk to coach Brown. He would come up to, he would come up and visit me in New York while I'm working out and just counting down. It was probably the longest three months of my life. Like it went from, I got back like end of July, end of July, 2007. And I I wasn't able to get back to the campus, become a full time student athlete like in December. So from August, September, October, November, I had to. I was just away, just out of sight, out of mind, just working out, working on my game and getting the feel of just like playing basketball or or whatever, becoming back on the team. So that's when Coach Brown was like, "Now nah, I'm with you. I'm with you. And then I, I ran through a wall for him. Yeah, I think that's so important, especially in college athletics. And you see a lot of players transferring nowadays, but they're really not necessarily transferring entirely for the school or the program. A lot of people will follow their coach wherever they go, especially if there's coaching changes, if they get hired elsewhere, a player right. may come to the portal and, and follow them. Um, right. So to have that kind of relationship and that kind of, you know, sort of connection with a head coach, who, you know, really is an educator or a mentor for you right. um, on and off the court. I mean, it really seems like he, left an impact on you, not only as a coach, but as a person. So that's really big cool to time. see. Big time, big time. Yeah, for sure. Um, we talked about the first year and, and sitting out and not being able to play, you know, your first collegiate minutes, but jumping to your sophomore year, playing nearly 25 minutes per game, averaging 9.9 .9 and 6.1 rebounds, awarding 8-10 sixth man of the year. Uh, that was your first full season of play, like you mentioned. What was it like to walk away with that honor and, and get that recognition at the conference level. So this goes back to Coach Barron again. So that first, the first 12 games of that year, I started. So I started and I had a couple of bad games, like the last two or three. I think it was a game against Providence. I didn't play too well, and I was very disappointed in myself about that. So I spoke to Coach Barron, and he was like, look, the energy, the way you play that fire, I want to bring you off the bench. Like I want, I know you could be six man. I know you. And for me at the time, I didn't look down upon anything wrong. I didn't, cause I was still playing minutes. I was still finished games. I was still getting that same respect from my teammates. You know what I'm saying? So he like envisioned that. He said, no, you could, you're going to be six man, just the way you play. And just that being, um, theoretically that being my, um, Literally, like my first year fully in college, and then being able to win eight, ten, six men of the year was like pretty dope for me. I was like, wow. When the article and everything came out, I was like, damn, that's that's like tough. You know what I'm saying? Like to just like win an award like that. So it was it was great. And it's kind of interesting to look at it that way too, because a lot of you know players maybe in the NBA might look at it as a demotion, but really you're playing the same amount of minutes and. Um, you know, you're the first guy off the bench, you know, Coach Barron trusts you do 
I mean, right. Right when there's, you know, foul trouble or an injury, you are yeah. 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 the next man up. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it panned out for you as well, winning that award. So, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, one year into college basketball, you know, at the collegiate level um, and you're already winning awards like that. Uh, yeah. It, was, yeah, it was very, 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 very appreciative. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the next year as a junior, you're second best on the team in scoring, rebounding, steals, and best in blocks uh, on your way to a selection in the All-Atlantic 10 third team. But what I really want to talk about from your junior year was the NIT run to the semifinal, uh, specifically the Nevada win. I mean, arguably your best game in college, 34 points, managed to lock down eighth leading score in the nation at the time, Luke Babbitt. What do you remember from that performance, specifically that game, um, and also just that run? I remember... Coach Coach Barron, I remember the coaching staff. I remember the 12, 13 NBA scouts that was uh that was there. And I'm I'm literally as I'm just like maneuvering, I'm I'm just thinking about what's going on, thinking about the game. And I'm like, yo, I play basketball as well, you know. This is what I'm thinking. Like, I play as well. So is that before that game? I'm like, yeah, I'm just going out there and hoop. My shot, my threes was falling. I hit one, then I hit two, and I'm like, okay. I just always knew, honestly, since I've been playing basketball, I always knew I could, I always thought I could get to the basket amongst anyone. Like any single person guard me, I think I could get to the basket. So going into that game, I was like, if my shot falling, it's going to be a good game. But I really was more focused on the defensive end because he was the key and the engine of that team. So that energy we started playing with in the NIT, I think us winning that game catapulted us to just for that next run. And then many people do call that my best game because of who I'm playing against. But I always feel my best game in the URI jersey is the following game. And my favorite game is the Virginia Tech game. Just winning that game. And going into um, went into go play at the Garden. It's the feeling of like that moment of just remembering that from back then, and just still I sit here to this day. Sometimes I just revisit that moment in that space and realize like, wow, like all lies on you. The things you're doing, it was it was dope. It was dope. Yeah, I can imagine making a run like that, especially into the month of March. I mean, the NIT is so overlooked; not enough yeah. people like yeah. talk about it. But that was really. In the program's history, if you look at the timeline of, of URI men's basketball, that was really the start. You know, I know yep. Coach Early may not have been there yet, but, you know, we had not played in, into the month of March until that point. Right. Um, you know, if we're going back to the 90s or the 80s, but right. that was really the start. So it must be kind of rewarding for you as well to kind of reflect on URI and think, well, we kind of set the stone, you know, set the, the we paved the way almost, set the stage. Well, one yeah. thing that I always admire about Coach Early as soon as he got the job, I spoke to him and he called me, like, talked to me about players, et cetera, et cetera. And just that intention to detail, intention to just knowing what he wanted out of his players and what he wanted to do, I knew he was going to be special. I knew he was going to be special. It was just, it was just like a wait and see moment. Yeah. It's one of those things, like, you know, right from the go. It was going to be more, similar feeling to Coach Barron, I'm sure. Well, for me, for I'm talking about in terms of the landscape of the people that's there. For me, Coach Barron was a true and honored success. Four-time A-10 Coach of the Year, big time, like, success. But, you know, many people have other views on things that I, I fully don't agree with, agree with. Because when you look at the numbers and the thing he's done there, it's like he had a great time there. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, and then jumping to your senior year. You're the only player in the country to average at least 17 and a half points, seven and a half rebounds, two and a half assists, one and a half steals, and a block per game. Uh, that led you to an all A-10 second team. Uh, also scored the first triple-double in Rhode Island history against Miami of Ohio. Uh, that was in the 2011 CBI. Uh, what made that season so special for you? It's your final time at URI and, and obviously putting up those numbers like that. Well, it was, it was the first time when I got on campus that I – looked at it and I'm like, this is mine. Like this year is my, everybody's going to look at me. Everybody's going to cater to me. What I do shows and prove what I do show and prove of what I do show and prove of what's going on or who 
like I have to control the dynamic. So yes, those numbers was fine, but it was also my hardest season mentally because of all of that. Um, and many times for nothing, selfishly, I, the second team had got me mad because a lot of publications other than the A-10 had me as first team, but A-10 was the only publication that had me as second team. So it was just funny that that had happened in the way it did. But I, I guess as a team, we just had to we finish fifth. If we had finished fourth or higher, it would have been better for me in that landscape. But, man, just that year, just just knowing that everything was on you and some games are good games, some games are bad game, and then the triple-double happened. And then I'm like, to know that from the greats that Lamar Odom, Katino Mobley, Tyson Wheeler, all these greats have played, and I got the first. I don't know. Is this, does anyone else have one I ever, or is it still only me? I believe it's just you, but I'd have to double check. Okay, that. yeah. So to still have that, that's like that's pretty dope to me. You know, that's like wow. So that's uh that's still a big, big fish. And I still look at that like wow, that's that's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And it's one of a few records that you have, um, or at least are within ranking, you know, on the the program record book. Um, and I also agree with you, by the way. I, I hate that the conference based on it looks at team performance they prioritize yeah. that over individual success but i i agree based off of your statistics i think definitely a first rewarding of a first team but um yeah i mean that's definitely interesting to see you put up those kinds of numbers but really you know to see what happens you know behind closed doors and see you know like what really goes into a season um yeah. you don't really hear about that as much you only kind of look at what happens on the court so i think that's that's definitely interesting right uh, but speaking of records, uh, you're currently ranked 19th in career scoring, uh, 10th in career steals. What is it like? Again, you kind of mentioned it with, you know, the triple double. But what is it kind of like knowing that you've left such a mark uh, all these years later and that you're still considered, you know, one of the best Rhode Island Rams in program history, at least in the stat column? You're right. I laugh, honestly, too. And that's when I think about it, because. When you look at stats and numbers, you think of the games like, so I'm telling you, like I literally only played three and a half years of college basketball because that first semester I missed about 12, 13 games when right. I was suspended, when I should have been playing. That's one. And then also when I do get back and put on the uniform, it's some games that I'm just getting back. Coaches didn't play me at all. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So for, for my first seven or eight games, I, I got in the game a little bit. It wasn't none of that. So if I look back at it and I take all those games and the time that I missed into consideration, I probably could have been higher. <laughs> when I think of it that way, that's the only time I saw you look like, damn, Dell, you probably could have been higher to an extent. But it is what it is, man. I'm telling you, it's still an honor when I see my name, when I go there and people still recognize me and still hold dear what I did then. And they know I always play with my heart and how much I love uh, how I love Kingston, I think is dope. Yeah, that is really cool. Uh, so do you still keep in touch with a lot of your former teammates from right now? Yeah, I spoke I speak to Marcus Jones, uh, Lamar Omer, Martel, Keith Cawthorn, Kaim C. Wright, Jimmy Barron. Yeah, I speak to I speak to a good select few, man. Uh Jimmy's with the Spurs now. Yep. Um, and me and his little brother was close. We always worked out. He's in Milan still playing. So yeah, it's just it's still pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I always love how, you know, sports and, and college athletics, especially basketball, you find it. It's, it's such a sense of community. You keep in yeah. touch with people that, you know, you previously played with or played for um, and, you know, are now keeping in touch with people that you're playing with. You know, I, I just think that everyone kind of knows somebody and all, all around the world, too. It's not just, you know, within yeah. Rhode Island or within the nation. But I think that's really cool. Um, you, you mentioned the Virginia Tech game, but do you have a favorite memory or story that comes uh, it comes to mind, you know, when you think of Rhode Island, what would that be? Favorite story. I have so much surreal memories. Like, favorite story. Could be off the of play, too. Yeah, the the NIT run was, was really pretty, pretty special. That feeling that time was pretty damn special. Pretty, pretty, pretty damn special. Every Providence game at home that I played all away was special just because the fans, the fans aspect. Um, but I guess, okay, the my crazy story is kind of basketball, but it's off the court. Rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. So this is 2010, and they're playing against the Phoenix Suns, I believe. And this is me knowing I'm going into the summer, working hard, trying to get to the league, trying to 
become become an NBA player, like work and grind and grind. So I'm watching the Phoenix series, and I always laugh at this story. And I'm watching what Kobe Bryant's doing out there, and I'm just like sitting here watching. And I'm like, if you make it, you got to guard that. <laughs> so the story is me thinking it's like 11 o'clock at night. I get up. I think I was talking to my brother or texting my brother. I get up and um, I just go to the gym after that game. It was game six. They won to go to the finals. I literally got up late. It probably was maybe 11, 12, something, maybe even later. As soon as that game finished, I just went in Keeney. The lights was off and I was just working out in Keeney. Just like it's no way you you I'm sitting here while Kobe is doing this and you trying to get there. So it was it was pretty dope. Yeah, that's cool. Those late nights and just grinding away. But really, when you have something on your mind, you kind of want to stay up all night and just right. get to work and grind and get it out of the way. But you're just thinking about that's just cool. You know, you're thinking about one of the best, you know, athletes of all time, not even just basketball players. Um, And again, rest in peace to Kobe. But yeah, it's really cool to just kind of have your mindset on that. And, you know, you want that you want what he has. You want that success. Um, Kind of shifting gears a little bit to the NBA. You graduate from your rights. It's sort of a bad timing situation with the 2011 NBA lockout, canceling summer leagues, canceling fridging camps. Uh, that meant you had to move, you know, abroad, start your professional career there. Um, you know, is that something that you always thought about? I always want to revisit. I always want to revisit. Um, I think if I don't get an NBA lockout in 2011, I'm an NBA player. Yeah, I still get a chance to do summer league and do all that stuff, but. For players like for fringe prospects, players like myself, that they want to see more, they want to see the lockout taking out the uh summer league, taking all that out. The lockout really hurt hurt my chances to to really show what I could do to, to right away while the while the teams are fresh on your mind. Because I had honestly, it's twenty. I feel, I don't know how many teams, but I had like eighteen, nineteen workouts. I was flying all over. I was going all over working out, and I had some hell of a workouts, like hell of workouts where teams is like, "Yo, keep," you know what I'm saying. So I always, I always say like, "Damn that lockout," but yeah, that's true though. But you know, going to Israel wasn't bad. My brother was playing there at the time, so being with my brother out there and one of my brothers also showed up. So I loved it, man. I loved all my experiences in Europe. It was pretty dope. Yeah. And that's actually my next question. I have two more questions for you, but real quick, it, it's funny how life just kind of throws those, those curveballs at you. I mean, I feel bad for, you know, thank God the NCAA provided an extra year of eligibility for those that were affected by COVID, but can't imagine graduating in 2020 and being a college basketball player and having similar situation as you, trying to break out and, and try and make the NBA draft and kind of just rob of the opportunities. So, yeah, I'm sorry that you had to go through something like that. But um, also, what what did you think of Israel? I went this uh this past summer. Oh, okay. I loved it. Amazing. Yeah. Tel Aviv is beautiful. Tel Aviv is beautiful. Jerusalem is nice, man. I had a great time. Great time. I was there in June. Uh, the beaches in Tel Aviv were amazing. Yeah, it's amazing out there. Amazing. Awesome. Awesome. But yeah, so you played professionally overseas over 10 years there. Along the way, you've had many stops, different countries. We talk about Israel. You played in uh, Colombia most recently. You know, you won several uh, championships just overseas, you know, playing throughout Europe. I'm sure you've met many different people, unique backgrounds um, yep. and kind of immersing yourself in, in different cultures. It's, you know, once in a lifetime thing to go to some of these places. What was that experience like for you? And what has this journey taught you about yourself on and off the court? It taught me I'm a pretty fairly simple man. Living in Italy for three, four years in Greece, I was in that culture. My family was with me, so it was it was pretty dope. So I would say my favorite place would be Renaissance, Italy was amazing, man. It the culture there embraced me so so well. Anyway, Renaissance, Italy, and Athens, Greece. When I played with Ike Athens and and Brindisi, those was the two teams where I felt the fans and the people loved me for me. Like for the way I played, the energy I played with, the team where I played with, they loved me for me. Not no, oh, he's coming, he's on a contract. No, for they loved me for who I am as a person for the most part. So I would say those two are my favorite places. Yeah, I'm sure that's really special too to to sort of create your own community and almost have your own fans within, you know, another country. I can't imagine about, you know, some of the the foreign prospects now in the NBA. We have so many of them that come from right. overseas and are now getting the opportunity to play here in the States. And 
Um, I mean, I think Wembenyama is is now the the most recent example of that. Right. You know, such a a fandom around this guy, and you know, he played overseas, and you know, none of us really got to see him play in person. But now coming over to a new country, experiencing something new, and um, kind of having your own fan base around that, you know, I guess for you to be in that similar situation, you know, maybe not to the extreme as as Victor right. Wembenyama, but um, that must be, you know, a cool feeling to know that you have, you know, so many people cheering you on in a place that you've never been before. Right. That's awesome. Uh, last question I have for you, you know, just going back to Rody real quick, will you be watching this season? And well, if so, I'm always watching, man. And like always watching, always um in tuned, always trying to get up there to catch a game, man. Like I said, that's home, home, like, Kingston, Rhode Island, they know what they did for me as a man. They know what they did for me as a person. They know what they did for me just in life. And I'll all the gratitude to them. And hopefully I'll keep one day I'll I'll be able to get back there on the coaching staff or something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I'm a recent grad, so I, I definitely understand that feeling. A lot of uh students are moving back in this weekend, Labor Day. So it's uh it's a little weird for me, but um you know, I guess with that, you know, what's your what's your current state of the program? You know, your thoughts on that? Um, I, think, I think Archie's the right man for the job, and I think wow. he'll he'll do the best in in terms of like getting Rody to where he needs to go back to the Hurley era. Yeah, for sure. I'm hoping he gets us over that hump, um, and I'm hoping that uh, I can actually come down and and check out a few games. Hopefully, I actually get to meet you in person as well. But in the yeah. meantime, Delroy, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, best of luck. I hope to once again meet you in person, maybe see you down in Kingston. Yep. Um, and I look forward to uh, to keeping in touch. And of course, go Rody. Yep.